Welcome to the Trinity Health IHA Medical Group Wednesday Wellness Series. Tonight's presentation is titled Hip and Knee Arthritis, and our presenting provider is Trinity Health IHA Medical Group Orthopedic Surgeon Ben Harper. Dr. Harper sees patients at our Brighton practice and is affiliated with Trinity Health Hospital Livingston, which is also in Brighton. Welcome, Dr. Harper. Good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. So my goal tonight is to give kind of an overview of hip and knee arthritis, what it is, a little bit of background, some treatment options, and some common things that are that are brought up, that are addressed. Um, so we'll get going. So first question, obviously, is what is hip and knee arthritis? So arthritis is a destruction of the cartilage surface of the joints. Now, under the hood, there's a lot of things going on. So there's inflammation caused by cytokines that produce pain. A lot of people wonder why their knee particularly swells. So the synovial B cells of the joint lining in the setting of arthritis make more fluid. We see that more in the knee because there's not as much soft tissue. Your hip joint also swells. It's just better insulated. Um, some conditions like, uh, like rheumatoid arthritis, there are actually different substances called metalloproteinases that cause destruction of the cartilage. When I eat chicken, there's gristle on the end of the bone. That gristle is cartilage. So um, there are increased contact pressures uh, also with the formation of arthritis. So when we look at x-rays, and we'll go through examples of x-rays in a little bit, but there will be subchondral sclerosis and osteophytes and subchondral cyst formation. But what most patients notice is subsequently more and more dysfunction and pain. But if you're sitting at home and you have knee or hip pain, are there other things that can cause knee and hip pain? And the answer is yes, there are a lot of things that can cause knee and hip pain, and that's what makes it a little complicated. So on knees, you can have different tendonitis conditions. The most common are like patellar tendonitis, hamstrings tendonitis, the iliotibial band on the outside of the leg. Um, there's a meniscus inside the knee, which is a kind of a C-shaped cartilage. There's one on the inside, one on the outside of the knee that can have uh, tearing or other problems. Uh, you can have referred pain from the hip that can cause knee pain. If that happens, usually it tends to come more from the groin, kind of down the inside of the leg towards the knee. Um, you can have pinched nerves in the back. People commonly call this sciatica, but it can cause a pain coming down the leg in various patterns, depending on where the area of nerve impingement is. For hips, kind of a similar list, really. Pinched nerves from the back. Uh, trochanteric bursitis is oftentimes more pain at the side of the hips, and a lot of people will say it hurts when I lie on my hip uh, at night on that side, or as our seats have moved from the old bench seats, which I loved, to more bucket seats that kind of pinch the sides of our hips, sometimes that's uncomfortable. Uh, psoas tendonitis can uh, have groin pain. The labrum in the hip is fairly analogous to that meniscus in a knee. It's another kind of soft cartilage that can have tearing or other problems. And then in the hip, you can have a, a, a hernia uh, in your lower abdomen or inguinal uh, crease that can cause pain in the groin as well. So where do we start? Um, usually we like to start with a history, a physical, and x-rays. And really you can get a ton of information from that. And listening to the history like, what type of pain it is, was it associated with an injury or not, does it hurt it with this activity or that activity, it can give you a ton of information. If you correlate that with a physical exam in terms of touching in the different anatomic locations to know what's in that area to hurt, you can get a lot. We like to get x-rays. Uh, it tells us, one, if there's a fracture, which, you know, if you've had an injury, that's always good to, to rule out off the, off the cuff. Um, it also tells us a lot about if is there arthritis or how severe it is to know where to start. And a lot of people balk at this, but not an MRI. MRIs can be great. They're not a good place to start. And one of the things that I get commonly is, shouldn't I get an MRI so that we have the answer? I tell people MRIs don't give answers. They give a lot of information. So they're a very detailed study. And I like to caution people heading into it that that information can be good and beneficial, or it can lead us on a bit of a goose chase MRIs, particularly knees and backs, after 30, 35, most of us are not going to have a normal MRI. And the next question comes, so what is relevant versus what may just be normal age-related? And to be sure that the findings on the MRI, if we have a pathology, correlate 
with the symptoms that are bothering you. So we don't wind up chasing something that may be normal age related. Um, and that takes some sorting through. And then plus or minus Google. I mean, I, I love to Google things and YouTube has been fantastic for home projects and there's a ton of good information out there. My caveat is that Google and, and advertisements, you know, the, the information can be biased or it can be misleading or perhaps not tell the, the whole story. So I've got a couple of uh, uh, information sources later on that, that give a little bit more clear information. So Google can, can be good, but it can also mislead a bit. Um, yeah, be, beware of uh, people trying to sell you something. So uh, this, I said, we we're going to talk about x-rays a little bit. So as you look at the right side of the screen here, here's a fairly normal knee. So if we look, here's the femur bone coming down, and then it'll have some flares at the end. These are called the condyles. And this is the tibia below it, the shin bone. The little fibula is over here. When we look, the end of the bone is here, and then there'll be this black space between the femur and the tibia. So that represents cartilage or the gristle on the end of the bone. A lot of times it is generally a little narrower on the inside than the outside. Um, when you look at the x-rays on the left of your screen, so this is a knee with significant arthritis, and there's a few things to note. A lot of times doctors look at an x-ray and say, oh, you've got arthritis, but, but what does that mean? So there are three distinct elements that we look for. First of all, the lack of that black cartilage space. So as the cartilage wears away, that black space will narrow until you get to bone on bone. And potentially after that, you can wear the bone. So cartilage joint space narrowing is one sign. The other thing is subchondral cystic formation. So little holes in the bone, they're fluid filled cysts just below the, the bone surface. So you can see little cysts in through here. And then the last is what they call subchondral sclerosis or whitening of the bone. Because as the cartilage wears away, that protective layer wears away, the bone absorbs that force and reacts and becomes more dense and hard. So in a very arthritic knee, that bone will be more hard than normal. So this is a knee x-ray, next is a hip. When we look at the x-ray on the left, this is a fairly normal hip. So this is the ball that is called the femoral head, and this is the socket, with, which is called the acetabulum within the, the greater pelvis. As you look again in a healthy joint, you should see a black cartilage space between the white of the bones. Now, hips are a little bit unique. They will always have this little divot in the acetabulum and this little divot in the femoral head, and that's for a ligamentous attachment. So that's normal and okay. When you look at an arthritic hip, again, notice that that black cartilage space has narrowed significantly, eventually bone on bone. And then you can see some little black spots. Those are the subchondral cysts. And then you'll see bone spurring, and that can occur in a variety of areas. Here we see it at the, at the top of the, the acetabulum or the cuff. A lot of times right beneath the ball here, you'll also get some spurring in through here called subcapital. Uh, bone spurring, or we call them osteophytes. So how do you treat it? And we're going to go through a list. So start with non-invasive means. I always like to start with things that are not surgery if possible. So exercise, therapy, weight loss, Tylenol, NSAIDs, which are anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen. There are some other medicines as well, and not narcotics. Yes, we'll talk about each one of these. Um, and then moving on up the chain, we can talk about bracing, injections of a variety, cortisone, PRP, stem cells, uh, visco supplements, which a lot of people call the gel shots, and then surgery. Um, each time you look at these things, it's kind of balancing how much is needed and risk versus benefit. So starting with exercise, there's good evidence that arthritic joints feel better and last longer with regular exercise. So you should take up jogging. No. Um, joint fluid production is improved through regular exercise. There is a desensitization to the, the, the pain from arthritis, and there's better maintained motion. Don't take up jogging necessarily. Non-impact -activ activities are best. So if you look at it, things like cycling, swimming, elliptical tend to be better tolerated than jogging, jumping, even things like tennis. Um, and as a general rule, if it hurts too much, it, it's probably not the right thing, at least not the right thing at that point in time. Moving up the chain, physical therapy. So this is different depending on the joint. Knees tend to do a little bit better than shoulders, which tend to do a little bit better than hips. 
with therapy, and it's important to realize for arthritis. Remember, there are a lot of other things that can go on around these joints that are not necessarily arthritis. Hip PT can get you a little bit better motion because arthritic joints tend to get stiff, but they don't tend to help as much with the pain. Um, it's very effective and really the answer for non-arthritic issues like those psoas tendonitis, the trochanteric bursitis, a lot of labral issues. Um, four to six weeks is usually good, and then they will optimize you through that, get you up and doing better. And then most people do require some form of an ongoing home program several times a week. And yes, most of us tend to wander away from that home program and the problem begins bothering us. And then we remember to get back out our therapy sheets. So walking, cycling, and swimming are better tolerated. Uh, we talked about weight loss, and this is one of those things that's not a popular topic, but it is important. Um, force magnification across the hip or knee is four to six times and more with stairs. So our kneecaps see seven times our body weight with stairs. So a gain or loss of 10 pounds of weight can make your knee gain or lose 70 pounds of force with each step. Um, moving on through medications such as Tylenol, uh, it is as effective as the anti-inflammatories for about half of patients. Works best if taken regularly. Up to 3,000 milligrams a day is safe as long as you have okay liver function. I do like the 500 milligram tablets just because it makes the math easier. I think the Tylenol arthritis is 650, but that gets kind of squirrely trying to hit 3,000 milligrams. Um, inset. So there is a whole variety of these medications, all different kinds. It's kind of the mainstay of arthritis treatment if you can tolerate them. They also work best if taken regularly if you need them. Three weeks of one will tell you what it's going to do for you. Some people do need to try a few. So for some people, one may be work better than another. They're short acting. They're long acting. Some are easier on the stomach if you have a little bit of GI upset. Not everyone can take these, though. So common things are if you have issues with blood pressure, if you have renal issues or kidney problems, this, um, this can be a problem or GI, especially like ulcers or bleeding ulcer history. The other thing to mention is people that are on blood thinners often should not take NSAIDs because they can behave as a bit of a blood thinner in addition. Um, other medications that I commonly get asked about are like glucosamine chondroid. Um, it's not recommended by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. So this is one of the links or websites that I'll put up later on that has pretty good information sources. It is quite safe. Um, it's not generally controlled by the FDA in terms of exactly what goes into each tablet. It's quite safe and generally fairly cheap, though. Uh, natural anti-inflammatories such as turmeric, capsaicin, kombucha, and others. We, we really, in the studies, it's tough to say if this is a placebo effect or not. Again, it is fairly safe for most people. Um, not narcotics. And just like weight loss, this is a, a topic that, that seems counterintuitive at first. I have pain. Why not treat it with pain medicines? And if Tylenol isn't enough, why not narcotics? Um, so from a surgical perspective, and there may be times this is reasonable, but from a surgical perspective, there are higher rates of complications and failures if patients are on narcotics prior to surgery leading up to it. This tends to desensitize you. It can, uh, this, this effect does not completely disappear even if we stop before surgery. It can be difficult to control pain after surgery if your body is already desensitized to the effects of narcotics and the long-term results are, are inferior. That's not to say that problems can't be treated with surgery, but if people are on narcotics prior to surgery, it's worth talking about what reasonable expectations are and how that might be a little different. Yep. More pain, lower satisfaction, and poor function in studies if you're on narcotics prior to surgery. So that's why we really do try and stay away from those. Um, bracing options. So everybody watched Forrest Gump and wanted to be that guy. Uh, they help about 50% or a little less of knee patients. They can be difficult to fit for some body types. So a lot of them are going to be hinge knee braces. You can get a compressive brace at a pharmacy that helps some with swelling. But if you've got arthritis you're in the knee particularly, it may tend to bow a little in or out depending on your pattern of arthritis. And these can help stabilize those a bit. But 
you know, you have to be strapped on and then how tight you strap them may cause further swelling beyond uh, all braces tend to slide down a little bit, which can be annoying. The nice thing is if you have a knee that bothers you with certain activities, you can put it on for that activity and take it off the rest of the time. So it is fairly easy and fairly cheap compared to a lot of other options. Um, injections. So there's, there's a lot of different injections to talk about. Cortisone is probably the mainstay of arthritis treatment currently. It's effective for most people, but a bit limited duration. And there's some, some variation here. You'll talk to people that feel that cortisone is the best thing ever. It cured them forever. You'll talk to people who got absolutely nothing from a cortisone injection. And I think both are true. There's some variation in how people respond. But the average is three to six months of pretty good pain relief starting out uh, that can decrease in effectiveness with time. Uh, yeah, subsequent injections may be less helpful. Visco supplements. So these have a lot of different names they go by, which makes it a little bit confusing. I think the most commonly I, I hear is gel shots. They're also called chicken shots, turkey shots, protein shots. Um, the real name is hyaluronic acid, which explains why they get so many nicknames. Um, they help a small percentage of patients, probably around 20% or a little less if you combine all the studies. So again, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons puts together what they call a meta-analysis where they try and take the data from lots of different studies and put it together to gain more power. Um, if they help, they tend to last a little longer. Some insurances don't cover them and they are quite expensive, $1,000 or more. So it's worth being sure that your insurance covers them if you want to try them. Um, not recommended by the Academy, not because they're necessarily bad or dangerous, but again, there's a question of, of is it worth it? Are they truly helpful? And in how many, what percentage of the patient population are they going to be helpful? Um, injections with PRP, which is protein-rich plasma and stem cells. Uh, there's a lot of interest. I think this is super intriguing. Uh, they're, in my opinion, they're not really ready for prime time. And this is another one of those things where I think advertising may get a little ahead of proven benefit. Um, if they're, if they're going to be used, probably more effective in earlier stages and probably not ready for prime time, in my opinion. Um, the placebo effect for this is strong. It's also worth mentioning that many insurances do not cover these, so they will be paid for out of pocket oftentimes, which I think may lead into that placebo effect as well if we're paying cash out of pocket. Um, so treating arthritis. So these are scope pictures. We commonly call it a scope. It's technically called arthroscopy, and this is one of those funny things in medicine. Arthroscopy is a knee scope, two small pokes on the front of the knee. Arthroplasty is a knee replacement, which are completely different procedures, and I hate that they sound so similar. Um, as we look at these pictures, the picture on the left is inside the knee. So with those two small pokes, one will be a camera and the other has instruments going into the knee to work. So we see the end of the femur, and this is the cartilage on the end of the femur. This is the top of the tibia and the cartilage there. What we're seeing here is, is the meniscus, that O-ring cartilage that people talk about a meniscus tear can be torn. And this is a piece of torn meniscus. And at times it can be very beneficial to go in and, and trim that meniscal tear. I think in the past, surgeries for meniscal tears were much more common. But I think in the past, we probably looked at all meniscal tears as the same. And as time has moved on, we have had greater understanding that these can happen in a few different situations. Like when I was a child, it seemed like every kid on the block had their tonsils taken out. And then it seemed like the decision-making changed and maybe we shouldn't do that quite so much. Um, so if you ever think about a meniscal tear, one of the most important questions to ask out of the gate is how much arthritis is present because a meniscal tear can happen in isolation where it's just a damage to the meniscus itself or a meniscal tear can happen as part of a global degenerative process where the, the knee itself is degenerative. You have arthritis, which produces a rougher surface. The meniscus may not be in as healthy condition and it all works together. So the, the picture on the right is a picture of a knee with more arthritis. So while you look at the, the picture on the left with a nice smooth cartilage cap, 
this picture on the right has this big defect in the cartilage. So that's arthritis with the absence and wearing away of cartilage. And you can see this piece here looks like it wants to, to flip off. That's called delamination. And yes, there is a meniscus tear as well. But looking at meniscus surgery, the expected outcomes would be very different between these two knees. Um, and arthroscopy or scoping for arthritis really isn't well advised. Um, it just it does not tend to change the natural course of arthritis. So if you have just a meniscus tear, a lot of those can be treated conservatively well without surgery. Not all, but a lot. Um, if you have more and more arthritis, your expectations going through a knee scope to just address the meniscus are different if you have more arthritis and they're not better. So that's an important part of decision making. Um, how do you treat knee arthritis surgically? So we talked through a lot of the non-surgical options. Surgically for knee arthritis, you're really talking joint replacement and considerations are partial joint replacement or total joint replacement. So this is a picture of an arthritic knee. Again, the cartilage on the inside of the knee is worn down. And this is a partial knee replacement. So the knee joint has three compartments, the inside, the outside, and then another one behind the kneecap, which you can see faintly outlined here. Um, this is a picture of a total knee replacement. So both procedures involve removing any remaining cartilage along with a bit of bone just beneath that surface. And then that bone is gonna be capped with a piece of metal. In knees, that is generally cobalt chrome. In hips, it's more likely to be titanium products. Um, that metal can be cemented to the bone or press fit depending on surgeon's preference and bone quality. There are pros and cons to each approach, partial knee or total knee. The partial knees tend to have a little bit faster recovery and they tend to feel a little bit more natural to a patient long term. But you only replace one part of the joint, leaving the other parts of the joint subject to potentially wearing out down the road. And then a lot of people have the impression that we can just kind of finish it out later on if needed. But really, once you've done a partial knee replacement, if you have to convert that over to a total knee, it's a bigger procedure. So if, if there's wear in more than one area, we generally advise going ahead with an appropriate procedure to, to address all areas of wear at that time. Um, people ask a lot about recovery, and that has changed dramatically in the last... Uh, constantly, but in the last 10 to 15 years, I mean, it used to be common to spend several days in the hospital and maybe go to a rehab facility for a few weeks afterwards. And most commonly now, knees and hips are done on an outpatient basis. Um, we encourage people to have a support network afterwards, someone to stay with them for a week or so. Uh, most people will use a walker for a week or two after surgery and then be able to move to a cane for another few weeks. Uh, particularly for knees in my practice, uh, physical therapy is a very important part of recovery, um, and it is sore afterwards. So this comes back to a little bit of the talk about pain meds and expectations. A lot of the advancement in the last 15 years, there have been huge advances in technique and pain meds and recovery protocols and physical therapy, but a lot of it really is, is education and preparation and getting patients ready for surgery as well. Um, so working with therapy afterwards and expectations for pain control that it is going to be sore afterwards is, uh, is, is reasonable and leads to a better recovery. Uh, we want to have most of the motion of a knee by about six weeks after surgery. Um, so most people, you know, two weeks with a walker, a couple of weeks with a cane, and then not using anything around the house. That does depend a bit on your general health and fitness and other ailments you may have if you have a knee replaced and have arthritis in the other hip, that may slow recovery a bit. Um, most people feel recovered by three months, but truthfully, there are continued benefits out to a year after surgery. Um, hip replacement. So this is a fairly similar concept. If you look at the pelvis here on the cartoon drawing and then the femur, the femur has a hollow portion in the middle, and that's going to have a metal stem go down that hollow portion. Uh, this can be either press fit, which is wedged inside the bone, and then the bone grows to the implant, or cemented to the bone. And generally, that decision is made based off of bone quality for the most part. The cup we call up here goes into the pelvis. 
Um, and then there is, again, a modular plastic piece. In a hip or knee replacement, there is a plastic piece called polyethylene, and that is designed to wear with time, generally 15 to 20 years or so. Um, it's worth noting that hip replacements feel a little bit more natural long-term compared to knee replacements. Uh, they have something called the forgotten joint score a year after surgery. How often do you think about having an artificial joint? And hips typically perform a little bit better on that. And this is a, an x-ray of a hip replacement. Uh, again, the pelvis with the, the, the the acetabular component here. It's worth noting, you do not always have to use screws within a cup. Some prefer to for a little extra fixation, some do not. There is not a right or a wrong answer there. You can see the ball here, and then a little bit of space between the ball and the cup, just like in the knee, the metal will appear white, and then sometimes these are ceramic heads, it's worth noting. Uh, the plastic will appear dark. Uh, sidebar, this is my soapbox, Advertising in Medicine. When I was a kid, there was a book, The Emperor's New Clothes, and the gist of it was that if you talk something up enough, often enough, and loud enough, people may just believe it. So the United States is one of only two industrialized countries in the world where direct-to-consumer medical advertising is legal. And there's a reason. It's us in New Zealand. There's a reason for that. When I see a commercial on television for Barbie or an automobile or a new, a new gizmo, I know they're trying to advertise and sell me something. But for some reason, when we see medical products advertised, we tend to believe it more. And it has more of a pull to us because this is our health and well-being at stake. But I do encourage you to take medical advertising with whether you say a grain of salt or appropriate skepticism. And the same thing with, with Google, it can be a fantastic information resource, but to be a little bit cautious. So in line of that, a few things that, that come up and people ask about computers or navigation. And a lot of things, technology and medicine is exciting and it's intriguing. I think as new things come out, one of the questions I try and ask myself is, is there a proven benefit or is this a cool gadget? So computer navigation, the studies show that it does decrease outliers in alignment between femur and tibia of the knee implants, which sounds good, but there is no proven benefit in function or longevity, at least in midterm follow-up. Um, it does add time and cost to the procedure, and sometimes there are additional incisions for these navigation arrays to go in, which leads to some potential concern for wound infection complications and drainage. Um, it really doesn't always address the soft tissue piece of the puzzle. So we talked about alignment, but it doesn't talk about the balancing of the soft tissues. I do think that there are a few instances that some of these technologies may have a niche. Um, for instance, if you have an old injury with a rod or a plate or hardware in uh, that, that would make traditional navigation, <clears throat> excuse me, less optimal, they may be perfect for that. Um, there's no proven benefit yet. Robotics is another uh, common topic that people ask about. This was a huge marketing campaign. For each hospital, these, the machine, each machine is over a million dollars. Um, if you have certain types of machines that are robotic machines, it may limit the type of implants that you can put in, and those may not be as proven or have the track record that other implants do. Um, computers and custom implants, uh, you know, custom implants. So the idea of this, I really like, and I, it just seems like it should make sense. It sounds great. You make the shoe to fit your foot and don't try and fit your foot into an ill-fitting shoe. I like that. But it does require pre-op imaging with either advanced imaging with either a CT or MRI, which adds some cost. And with CTs, there's additional radiation to each patient getting that. Um, other concerns, the implant manufacturer is, is still not as predictable as other mainstream implants. Uh, each implant you make, you also have to have custom cutting jigs for surgery. Um, the metallurgy is different in a lot of the implants that are made custom versus the more main, mainstream mainline uh, conventional, which are cast forged. 
it's also worth mentioning it's rare, but if, if something happens between the imaging and the time of surgery, that was the one implant that you had made, and that can get a little squirrely trying to, uh, trying to recover from that. Uh, so currently there's not studies showing reproducible benefit, but there's definitely increased cost. And this is what it comes back. It's an intriguing concept. A lot of these things, it's alluring, but is there defined benefit to it? So standard implants, just the parts are $4,000. For a custom implant, it can be over $20,000 just for the parts. Um, it's promising and I like the idea, but I don't think it's ready for prime time and universal adoption yet. Uh, advertising ops also with these, it's worth noting, there's big dollars at play here and they're investing those a lot in advertising as well. Um, considerations for surgery. So that's off my soapbox for a bit. Each patient needs to be considered for the balance of risk versus benefit. So as you look at it, a lot of people ask me, when is it time to consider like surgery, and I would say, one, we want to look at the x-rays and know that you have advanced arthritis. Two, I want to know that we couldn't get away with less and give you good function, reasonable quality of life without something that inherently has more risk. And three, we come down to balancing the risk versus the benefit. And for everybody that may have severe arthritis, their perceived benefit may be different depending on their desired activity level. And for most patients, they have a, a variety of risk of surgery having a good or negative outcome. Um, if there are modifiable risk factors, in other words, things we can change to make your risk lower considering the surgery, I think it's prudent to do so. So what are those common targets for modifiable risk factor? Obesity, diabetes, tobacco, nutrition, narcotic pain meds, alcohol, and activity level. As we come through this, this chart shows different health conditions along with the expected increased risk of complications. And these are major complications. And risk is just that. We don't know. It's, it's a statistical odds game. So if you look at some, some disorders have a higher risk than others, and others of these can be optimized, in other words, made as good as they can be, but they're going to have some increased risk. We'll talk a little particularly about diabetes in a little bit. So that's each condition in isolation. But if you add these together, the cumulative risk can get high quickly. So this is something that should be considered if we failed these non-operative means and we're looking at potentially considering surgery what is my risk headed in and, and can it be made better? Modifiable risk factors. So hard one first, the obesity. Um, you know, when you look, uh, a BMI between 18 and 35 is really, really target. Um, below 18, some worry about malnutrition and higher rates of infection and complication. Uh, as you get certainly over 40, you start having higher rates of expected complications. And for some people over 50, the risk may be prohibitive. And it's worth saying different surgeons may have guidelines on this, different hospitals, different institutions, different insurance networks, all may have different standards for this. But it's worth considering if we can move the bar on the risk of a negative outcome, it may be worth doing. Um, preoperative narcotics, we talked about a little bit beforehand. So these are recognized as a risk factor for failure and may have, depending on the amount and the type, up to three times greater level of complications. We try and decrease them a little bit beforehand so that they can be a bit more effective after surgery. With diabetes control, generally our mark for this is a hemoglobin A1C under 7.5. So the hemoglobin A1C is an average glucose over three months that will change that. So it takes some time to go up and down. There are day of glucose uh, goal numbers as well. Um, cardiology evaluation. So for people with some heart concerns or issues, this is the leading cause of cancellations right before surgery is that they, they need further cardiology workup or intervention to be optimized for surgery. Uh, how do you treat arthritis? Now we talk about surgery. So this is this is the final line. This is probably the most definitive solution to arthritis with most reliably good results. And if you look at patients that have done regular exercise, they've done PT, they've tried Tylenol and NSAIDs, where we've managed weight, medications, and comorbid conditions are managed, it goes pretty well. 
there's some realistic expectations. Um, so some things, especially with knees, I like to tell people in advance that we can make a bad arthritic knee a lot better, but it may not be perfect. It may not be your God-given knee. And some of those things, you know, just knowing about in advance can make people more happy. So if you have an incision along the front of your knee, right after surgery, just to the outside of your body from that incision will be very numb. You'll get a lot of that feeling back with time, but it may not be perfectly normal. And that's okay. It's just something you should know headed in. Most knee replacements can and will click a little bit. So as you move side to side or occasionally roll over certainly in bed, you may hear a little click and that's okay. Um, most patients after knee replacement find kneeling uncomfortable. I don't forbid it necessarily unless you have a very thin kneecap or patella. I don't forbid it, but I want you to know it may be uncomfortable and people may find that they like to get a set of knee pads or put down some kind of padding if they're going to be on their knees for any length of time. Uh, generally, pain is much reduced for day-to-day -day activities. Those things like grocery shopping, out at Lowe's, on their feet, playing golf, pickleball, things like that, they'll do much better. But if you're on your feet long enough or hard enough, you may still have a bit of swelling and discomfort. Um, again, hips tend to feel a little bit more natural or normal long-term and that better scoring on the forgotten joint score a year after surgery. Um, some good online references. So these are worth looking at, I believe, and this can get around a lot of the issues of um, the advertising and Google and magazines and things that pop up on your Facebook page, uh, which is the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. So both of these will have a section of the website geared towards patients and patient information and they are they're really fantastic. Uh, giving you good quality information, and then you can look up what, whatever you want, and, and they'll 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 have pretty good uh, patient information there that is available. And I think that is it. I think that's all I got, Alice. All right, looks good. I learned a lot. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll... Well, I didn't bore you all. No, not at all. I didn't realize you could do a partial knee replacement. Yeah. I don't know why. I never realized that, but that's that's really cool. Well, it's interesting. For sure you can. And I'll bring up something else that's mentioned occasionally. People ask, can you have a partial hip replacement? And you can, but that is a really different ball game. So partial knee replacements replace the end of the femur generally and the top of the tibia in one side or the other. Occasionally, there'll be the back of the kneecap and the groove for the kneecap. All of that is for arthritis. Partial hip replacement is a simple ball and socket joint, so there's only one compartment. So partial hip replacements are generally done more in the setting of a hip fracture where the, the ball breaks off of the neck. So we replace the ball with that stem that goes down the femur, but we don't replace the cuff. Um, it is a, a shorter surgery than a total hip. It has a lower risk of, of some of the hip complications such as dislocation, but there's always a price to pay. You can still get arthritis on the socket side. So you have to balance the, the, the risk of longer surgery or complications versus the potential advent for, for bothersome hip arthritis and the patient's desired activity level. Okay. So many of you have found your way to the Q&A tool. If you have not and you have a question you'd like to ask, you can drop it into the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And look for the two speech bubbles and Q&A. Do not put it in the chat, please, because I want to make sure we see it. So we talk about knee replacements, but what if you've had your knee replaced and you're starting to look at a revision. So someone has a 20 year old knee replacement. Do you recommend doing a revision if they're starting to have issues? So it really depends. Um, you know, people, one of, the, one of the funny things I hear is people say, you know, after they've had a total joint replacement, so a total knee or a total hip, they'll say, I think I'm getting arthritis again. And there are a lot of things that can happen, but interestingly, arthritis is not one of them. So with a total joint replacement, remember the process of arthritis is that cartilage wearing away and we replace the cartilage. So there is no cartilage to wear away. You can't have arthritis. Saying what can go wrong with a total knee or total hip is kind of like saying what can go wrong with a car. There's a lot. 
there's a lot of different things that you have to look at. I'll say some of the common things as you look at a joint that's maybe in that 20 year range is the, the plastic wearing out. And that's something, you know, there are different, um, different opinions on this, but I usually tell people it's worthwhile stopping in to get an x-ray and talk about things maybe every five years, just to look at x-rays and see how much plastic there is to be sure that the, the implant between bone and metal is still solid. And that can give you an idea, kind of like checking your brake pads. You would rather check and know when you're getting close so that you can just have your brake pads replaced instead of getting into rotors and everything. So if we can just change out the plastic piece, that's a lot easier than having the metal behind it gummed up. Common things that I see are plastic wearing out or the, the, the metal bond to the bone coming loose can happen. Um, you know, honestly, though, a lot of times when a joint has been behaving well and acts up, it could also be a tendonitis concern. So it's, it's one of those things that's worth looking into. If it's 20 years old and the plastic has worn out, I think, yes, it's reasonable to consider a revision for that if it's bothering you for sure. Okay. So we have someone um, here tonight who had their hip replaced. And now they are asking how long before they can get their knee replaced. Different surgeons have different thoughts on that as well. Uh, <laughs> you'll notice a the theme there. Um, you know, uh, like personally, I really don't advocate if people want to have both knees or both hips replaced at the same time. I really don't advocate that. I like probably somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three months in between surgeries. But the real answer is we want you to be recovered from one surgery and, and able to do rehab well before you tackle the next one. Okay. And we have several people who are asking about recovery period. So I'm going to try to put some of these questions together for you. So you have a healthy 75-year-old who is considering a hip replacement. And they live alone and they are wondering how many weeks should she plan to be homebound um, before, you know, they can kind of gain their independence back in terms of driving and getting around. For sure. So um, a few thoughts. Uh, one, I ask that people have somebody in the house with them for a week. Uh, just to be sure they're doing well. You know, most people, surgery that day, you'll even do some stairs before you leave the hospital that way with therapy. Now, you're not doing wind sprints up and down the stairs, so that's going to be a good handrail on one side, a cane in the other. So some things like being sure you have a good handrail, considering where you're going to spend your recovery. Some people say, well, I could do it at my house, but I live in a tri-level and the bathroom's upstairs, so I'd have to be up and down all day. But my sister lives in a ranch and I could recover with her. Well, that's a lot easier. Um, the driving question uh, depends on a few things. One, you're supposed to be off narcotics to drive. So a couple of weeks, most people are, are really off narcotics during the daytime in general. Uh, some more than others, that, that's variable. I have some people who really don't take narcotics meaningfully after surgery. Um, the other thing is, is it your right leg or your left leg? Because your right leg is your driving leg, unless you drive a clutch, which I've learned to ask. It's not as common anymore. Um, so they recommend that it takes about four weeks for that to return to a normal reaction time, getting from gas to brake. And that's tricky in terms of, of safety. You can drive, but is it safe to drive? So generally, we recommend about a month before driving. And there may be some home therapy options uh, if you need therapy after surgery where they can come to the house for the first couple of weeks if people are having trouble getting out uh, during that time. And I think there are also some transportation options as well. So sure. Is that something that maybe the staff in the office could help coordinate or at the hospital could help point you in the right direction? Absolutely. The care coordinators are fantastic at that. Great. Okay, does it complicate surgery if you have a Baker cyst behind your bad knee? No, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I get asked about Baker cysts a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a common question in our webinars. For sure. So Baker cysts are really quite common, and it's one of those things like, uh, you know, we, sh we never should have named it. Um, knees that are arthritic, we talked about the synovial B cells will make extra fluid. And you'll see that particularly in knees because we don't have as much soft tissue. 
in knees, there will be kind of two little bumps down uh, just below the kneecap to either side where there's kind of a weakness in the joint lining. And as you get more fluid, those kind of bubble out. They may look like just tiny little horns. And then the top of the knee, above the kneecap, it takes more fluid to fill that space. And if we have a bad knee and it swells after activity, we don't seem to think much of it. It's like, yeah, I've got a bad knee and it swells. But the Baker's cyst we get concerned about because it's in the back of the knee. But that same fluid within the joint, there's a weak spot in the lining of the back of the knee that that joint fluid can commonly escape out and form a Baker's cyst. So those are quite common with knee arthritis. They can be small, they can be large, they can be simple, in other words, one cyst, or they can be complex with little septations in them. Um, some of them can have a valve between the joint and the Baker's cyst such that your knee gets aggravated and the cyst fills, and then the valve swings shut so it can't really absorb that fluid back into the knee and be absorbed by the synovial lining. Generally speaking, those do not complicate uh, knee replacement surgery at all. In fact, they used to do a lot more surgeries to just do an isolated removal of a Baker cyst going through the back of the knee and find that cyst, tie off the communication to the knee and remove the cyst but they had a fairly high recurrence rate of those cysts um, coming back. They would actually just grow a new cyst if you went back in. What was the base or the stalk that you tied off is now the other end of the cyst. It just reformed. Um, they also had a, a higher rate of infection because the skin in the back of the knee is fairly thin and it's in a flexion crease that's hard to keep clean, uh, especially as it's bending back and forth. But generally speaking, Baker cysts are common and do not complicate knee surgery to a significant degree. Okay. Uh, there are a few questions about pain in the joint following surgery. So it looks like someone had, um, an, I'm trying to see, a knee replacement about a year ago. And they're wondering why they might have increased pain. Is there an issue with like the prosthetic piece or is there a possible infection? And is it is it possible to experience soreness in that joint once it's replaced? Unfortunately, all, all are possible, yes. Um, generally speaking, when you're a year out, if you're still having pain, there are a few things that should be looked at. And that, you know, coming back to look at x-rays to be sure that things are well-placed, to be sure that they're still well adhered to the bone, to be sure that like the kneecap is still tracking well, assuming we're talking about a knee here, um, to be sure that things are well-placed overall. In terms of infection, yes, that is, that is unfortunately one of the risks to varying degree, depending on your, your stratification uh, that can happen. And there are some physical exam findings, like, you know, certainly any kind of drainage from the joint that far out is a, is a real big concern. But, but a lot of things, probably the best place to start for infection is a, a lab workup called a SED rate and CRP. Um, it's a blood test you don't have to be fasting for. A lot of people haven't heard about it. Um, it is very similar to when your primary doctor may worry about like a pneumonia or a bladder infection. They get a blood draw and look at your white blood cell count uh, to see the likelihood, how, how active it is, how your body is. Um, the white blood cell count does not correlate well with prosthetic or fake uh, joint replacements, but the SED rate and CRP are a similar idea. They're inflammatory markers. I tell people they are sensitive, but not specific. Um, in other words, like if I had a camp and I wanted to set up a tripwire to be sure that I'm safe. Um, you could set it real sensitive, but it's going to go off every time a leaf falls. But you know you're safe if it's quiet. So these labs can go up in a variety of conditions, notably like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, psoriatic arthritis, um, polymyalgia, rheumatic, or typically they, they run a little higher. But if you get it and it's normal, the likelihood of infection is low. If there's further suspicion or if those labs are really high, Probably the next step to evaluating for a joint infection a lot of times is, is getting a sample of the joint fluid that can be tested in the lab and there are set of parameters for what we, we, we feel is safe and what, what is concerning for infection. Uh, you know, but there, there are other things. So that's x-rays to see if the implants are good. We've got lab tests for infection. 
And then other things like physical exam, it is possible that, that you have developed a tendonitis or possibly had a tendonitis mixed in with your arthritis before surgery that is still present. It's a long-winded answer. Sorry. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. That's so interesting. So if you're feeling some soreness, maybe it's not pain, but soreness in or around that joint, could there um, be something else going on? Like, could it be a muscle issue or? Oh, for sure. And you know, a lot, a lot of things, particularly with knees, you look at one of the, the more important things after knees in terms of satisfaction and happiness is the amount of range of motion. In other words, how flat that knee will go. And a lot of times you see a knee that goes pretty flat, but like physical therapists or orthopedic surgeons will pick out pretty quick. It's like pretty flat is not flat. And then you walk with a bit of a crouch gait, which really can overtax particular quadriceps, it puts a lot of abnormal forces across the knee. So if you've ever tried walking like with a with a squat, like a basketball coaches used to call it duck walk, where you squat down and walk, it, it really tires you out quickly and it's sore on your knees. So if you really can't get that knee all the way flat, um, that's one of the things that can lead to soreness. Okay. So we always have a very well-educated audience and they have brought up a procedure that I've never heard of. So let's see if you know this. Um, oh dear. Oh, so can you explain? So it sounds like it's a new treatment where nerves in your knees, are they frozen or burned so that they stop, um, they stop the pain or they kind of give you some pain relief after knee replacement surgery? Is that- For sure. Okay. I think you're talking about like radiofrequency ablation. So I don't actually do that. Um, generally, there are some pain clinics that will do that. Uh, some physiatry clinics will do that. And every time I say physiatry in a room, I feel like I just go ahead and start explaining because most people have not heard of physiatrists and they are just an underutilized resource. They're fantastic. They can do a lot with um, physical function, the way the body functions, how it all works together. Like, um, you know, a lot of times if people may have both hip and knee and back issues and they all affect one another. So they help in sorting that out. Uh, the, the radio frequency ablation um, can help with pain. Generally, I this is not my specialty, but I believe they'll generally do a trial where they give a local numbing agent into that sensory nerve and see like, does this help significantly with your pain? And that's an option. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, it can be a really good option. I, I do want to be sure generally that we've checked everything else first so that we've checked for the x-rays and the alignment and made sure that the that there's no loosening, made sure that there's no infection and made sure that everything is structurally sound first. The last thing we want to be doing is inadvertently blinding you to a pain that's there for a reason that we really need to, to know about. But that is a reason why, yes. Okay. Okay, so there are a number of questions around um, age restrictions for a hip or knee replacement, as well as weight. So can you talk a little bit about age and where um, you would or would not recommend somebody replace their knee or hip? And then talk a little bit about weight. And we often get these types of questions when we have um, any kind of joint surgery. And it's common that people say, you know, I'm, I need to lose weight, but I can hardly walk. <laughs> so it's, I think, hard. And, and this woman is asking, is weight really that important when a patient is in constant pain? Right. No, good question. So, um, yeah, uh, age first. And at both, at both of these questions, I will say up front, probably different uh, provider to provider. Uh, so... The world the way I see it. Um, for age, um, I don't have firm cutoffs, no. Uh, I think that anytime you look at this, it comes back to risk versus benefits. So this comes up more in hips, really, uh, for younger ages. There's a process called avascular necrosis, where it's an issue with deficient blood supply to the, the ball and the the ball of the hip joint basically stops getting blood supply and starts collapsing. This can happen in your 20s or 30s. And yes, that is far younger than any patient wants a hip replacement and far younger than I want to be doing it. 
and there are things to consider like you know you're going to have to have further surgery in your lifetime and when you look at like patient optimization trying to be sure that we've got you in as good a shape for surgery as possible that is super important when the outcome of this surgery will affect you for another 60 plus years i mean the the stakes are high that being said leaving someone with a dissolving hip and saying, you know, my arbitrary age cut off is 55. So you've got to wait 20 years. That, that doesn't make sense to me either. So I think that everything has to be considered in balance there. On the other side of the spectrum, when you look at, at um, older patients, um, the same thing, I think that you, you know, to be honest, you don't worry as much about the 20 to 30 year uh, survival rate of a, of a hip or knee replacement at certain ages. It has to be a question of quality of life versus risk of surgery. And I think that's something that a patient and doctor have to discuss together. Um, you know, some of my, my older patients are actually quite healthy and, and quite active. And if it is one joint that is really limiting their quality of life or their ability to live their life, yes, they may have some additional risk that if compared to someone who is a bit younger, but do they, where does the risk versus benefit? Like is most of their pain and limitation from arthritis, are they generally healthy enough to undergo surgery? And would they reap benefits of enjoying a healthy joint? So I do not have firm age cutoffs. Uh, there are considerations that are unique to, to either the very young or the very old category. Um, on to weight, yes, it is a very real risk factor. Uh, same thing with nicotine. And I don't bring these things up saying like, oh, just lose weight or oh, just quit smoking. They are difficult. They are hard and they are important. Um, that's a tough thing because you look at some people that have struggled with weight all of their life and they have severe arthritis that, that really does hurt and really does limit them. And there, there are certainly things to be considered in that. And they can do very well after joint replacement. But the flip side, the risk is very real, particularly a blood clot infection. And if we encounter those risks, that same population that was an increased risk for, say, getting an infection, is at increased risk of not being able to cure that infection for the same reasons. Um, and again, all things have to be considered. So I, I'm not a huge fan of hard and fast cutoffs, we, we shoot for a BMI below 40. Um, it used to seem that the that it was kind of a linear curve. In other words, with a little bit of weight gain, you'd gain a little bit of risk and it would just keep going. But it's really more of a logarithmic increase. So as you, as you get above 40, it really starts to take off. As you get above 50, it's, it's, it's quite high. Um, so there are times when the risk of a major medical complication, you know, is it, just too high to consider surgery, even though from the mechanical aspect, yes, it makes sense. You've got a bad bearing. I can fix the bearing. The question is, can the rest of your body survive it? Will the biology support it? In other words, are you likely to get an infection or a clotting disorder or something like that? So it comes down to, I don't want to hurt people inadvertently while trying to help. And there are, I will say, it, I commonly, it is true, is you have bad joints, it is hard to get exercise and lose weight. But I will say, I think that's a bit of a misconception, you know, that the, the weight loss being all about exercise, um, a lot of it is, is really through nutrition. And we have developed some fantastic resources for working on the, the caloric and the nutrition side of that, including surgical as well as non-surgical. And I, I really, uh, there's, a, there's a role for each, but, but favor meeting with people. I think that weight loss in America is one of those things that for some odd reason, we have decided that we should be able to do on our own. No one would try and manage their cancer or their diabetes on their own, but we, we have this stigma that we should be able to do things like weight loss or battle depression on our own. And, I, I, I just, I really feel that that's unfortunate because these are, these are real things that, that we really can get help with. Yes, absolutely. And I would encourage anybody who's struggling with um, weight loss to tr trying to get to any kind of a surgery, definitely reach out to your uh, primary care physician because like you said, Dr. Herbert, there are lots of resources and your primary care is probably a great place to start, I would imagine. Fantastic. Um, okay. 
So we'll do just a couple more minutes of questions. Are you good to hang for one more minute here? For sure. Okay. So it's somebody, okay, a couple people are asking about, um, let's see. So who th this person says their primary care physician advised them that seniors who have their knees replaced are happiest when they're just in day-to-day -day activities, but the seniors who are more active in sports like cross country skiing and pickleball are not as happy with their knee replacements. Do you find that to be the case with your patients? Let me be sure I understand that people with a lower activity level are happier with joint replacements. Yes, that was a much more succinct way of saying it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, uh, I think particularly knees, they, coming back to, they don't feel quite as natural. And I think this comes back to when you're, you're meeting and you're asking the question, is joint replacement right for me? It depends on what you're doing. And they, they do have some, some, some scales and questionnaires that you can do. Um, and just because you have arthritis on x-ray does not mean that joint replacement is right for you for a variety of reasons. Perhaps, you know, you have arthritis, but you have minimal pain and you have minimal uh, limitation in your day-to-day -day activities. I would say, why have joint replacement? Um, I, I don't know that I would say that's true. I, th I think that people that want to be active, the, the flip side, my counter argument to that would be, we do joint replacement so that you can be active, so that you can do those things. I, I personally don't love people uh, running, especially distances on joint replacements. I tell people it's kind of like, you know, you can do burnouts in your driveway and it'll be fine that day, but your tires won't last as long. So once we go to, you know, your your time and effort and recovery of doing a joint replacement, we just want to want to take care of it the best we can. Um, things like golf, bowling, um, even even skiing. I don't want you to be aggressive and be jumping off of slopes down uh, down double black diamonds, but uh, and risking injury. But but I encourage people to live their life, and I think that that people that head in and have a conversation about what joint replacement can and can't do can be exceedingly happy with the improvement in activity level. So it sounds like your main takeaway is to avoid some of those impact sports True. and activities. Okay. Yes, and try and not break things. <laughs> okay. Um, what do you tell people who have other conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or fibromyalgia? Can you um, can you do surgery on their joints and does that work? Yes, good question. Um, both both conditions, yes, uh, both conditions can benefit significantly from joint replacement. I think that both have a few caveats, as a lot of things do. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is kind of a, oh, to put it in simplistic terms, I think it would be fair, I'm not a rheumatologist, but to say that it is a quirk in your immune system where it bites against you a bit. And there are some associations with uh, increased infection with that. Uh, the rheumatoid medications that are available today have dramatically changed the world in a good way. Um, you just, you know, they're, they're really effective. The, the degree of impairment of people with rheumatoid arthritis is not nearly what it was in years past. Um, you know, they, they sometimes work by turning down your immune system, which gets to be a bit of a double-edged sword with the concern for infection around the time of surgery. And it depends on the medication, whether you continue that throughout the perioperative period or whether we go on a holiday around that to allow your immune system to recover. So that's rheumatoid. Um, uh, sidebar for gout, uh, if you have gout, that commonly affects the, the, the feet mostly, but it can affect other joints, and you can still have gout flares after a knee replacement or hip replacement. Uh, feet are more common than knees and, and hips are, are much less common. Um, fibromyalgia, uh, this is one of those things that happens in life and it stinks just like rheumatoid and we wish it didn't, but it does. It can cloud the water a bit. So back to a realistic conversation, when, when you're talking about joint replacement in the setting of fibromyalgia. You want to look at x-rays. You want to be sure that there is severe arthritis. You want to differentiate 
arthritis like pain from the joint and stiffness versus some of the other common common pains that are more fibromyalgia because you know it's not a shocker joint replacement is fantastic for arthritis related pain but if you head into it thinking you will be pain free that's probably setting yourself up for disappointment. So to talk about realistic expectations when you're in the office, the different areas and types of pain and what we can expect to improve versus what we really can't and, and being sure that you have good indications for surgery with advanced arthritis. Okay, one last question. Um, can you ever get to a point where you've waited too long to replace a joint? Hmm. In it, it, yes and no. Uh, these answers are all long-winded. I'm sorry. So with hips, there is more of a concern on the cup side that they can wear bone away. So we talked about avascular necrosis where the ball or the head can collapse, but it's really more the cup side where you start wearing away bone in the pelvis and, and there's difficulty in having enough bone to attach the cup to. Now there are other options with some buildups or some augments that we can do to help that. Um, so, so not so much too far for a joint replacement to be done. Uh, I think that the other considerations as joints get worse and worse and worse is your general health. So there's this balance of when is the sweet spot or the good time to consider joint replacement. And certainly we want for people to have significant pain and significant limitations in their, their, their activities that are desired in their day-to-day -day life. But we also want them to be as healthy as possible. So if you, if you find the sweet spot where they're still healthy and active, but really having some significant limitations, they fail those conservative means, past that with years of decreasing activity, they're going to be less well conditioned. Their recovery is going to be a little slower. As most of us age, we develop more health problems, which may add to more risk of surgery. And that balance has to be considered. So no, in general, it's, it's, it's not common to, to say that this joint is too far gone. We can't do anything. I won't say never, but, uh, but I think that it does it does bring up the question of where is that sweet spot? And we don't want for people to let too many years go by. One, they're missing out on life. And two, that you know, they may actually have a slower recovery from years of, of not, not being as active. And that comes back to those healthy arthritis treatment things of staying active, you know, trying to get your, your weight and your, your other medical conditions as good as they can be, keeping the motion to the joints, keeping stretch. All right, I will read you one comment, not a question. Somebody wrote, your Grand Rapids patients miss you. <laughs> and um, I really appreciate you being here and giving us all of your time and expertise. You're welcome. Quick answers are not my specialty. <laughs> I'm chatty, but I appreciate you guys uh, being here and listening in and welcoming me. Thank you so much.